Friday, July 18, 2014. Law professor and divorced father of two, Dan Markle, returned home to his peaceful, upscale neighborhood at about 11 a.m. He was on the phone to a friend as he approached his house. He said that someone he did not recognize was in the driveway. This chilling statement was the last thing his friend ever heard from him. A moment later, the friend heard what sounded like a grunt, a scuffle, and then silence. What's going on with him? I don't know. The, the, the driver's side window is all bashed in, and he's got blood all over his head. Dan Markle had been shot in the jaw. He would die the next day. So what happened to him? The case was widely publicized at the time, but the truth was only revealed in stages, a tale full of twists and turns. Were you involved in any way in a plot to kill Dan Markell? No. Do you remember having a conversation with Charlie Adelson about his brother-in-law being in an accident? That was a lie, right? No, that's what Charlie said. He that told was... you that he was in an accident? He'd tell you that there was a murder? Dan was vocal about his legal opinions on his blog, such as his opposition to the death penalty. Original speculation about his murder suggested that maybe he'd made enemies in his career. But as the case unfolded, an awful plot would be discovered much closer to home. Secret recordings, custody arguments, and hit men. This is the terrible case of the Adelson family. Our second speaker is Dan Markell. Uh, greetings, everybody. Thank you very much to, uh, to Nick and to Eugene and to um, Todd and all of my co-panelists, as well as to um, uh, the wonderful folks at the Federal Society who have been so exceedingly generous to me over this last year. Uh, it's an honor to be here and share some thoughts with you about this big project that I've been working on. Dan was born in Montreal and raised in Toronto. He was a high-energy kid, more interested in climbing, baseball, and comics than schoolwork. He was underperforming in class, but in third grade, he sat an aptitude test. He got the highest score in the school at the time, also the highest score the school had ever seen. So he was a smart, capable kid who just needed to apply himself. He focused at school and developed an ambition to study at a prestigious American university. Hard work and dedication paid off. He was accepted to Harvard and left Canada with his head held high. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard completed a master's degree at Cambridge University in England, and later returned to Harvard to do his law degree. When he married Wendy, he was teaching law at Florida State University. She was seven years younger than him, a law student at the University of Miami. She too had graduated magna cum laude and had a master's degree from Cambridge. Both Dan and Wendy were on track for successful careers as well-established lawyers. Speaking of which, a good lawyer can fight for justice on your behalf. Like if you've been injured in an accident, you might feel alone and scared, not knowing where to turn as you face physical, emotional, and financial costs. The traditional route to compensation can be a maze of paperwork and bureaucracy, but your serious injury could be worth millions. That's why you need a good lawyer to help you navigate the red tape. Luckily, we've teamed up with Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. With Morgan & Morgan, you don't pay a dime unless you win. Over 3 million people like you call them each year, and they've recovered a total of over $20 billion. Morgan & Morgan have revolutionized the process for the digital age. You can submit your case in just the click of a button. All it takes is a few minutes and an easy form, and you could have a legal team fighting for your dream verdicts, which could be millions. I injured my shoulder at my last workplace, and an injury lawyer helped me get the money I deserve. You can check out the link in the description and see how injury lawyers like Morgan & Morgan can do the same for you. Dan met Wendy on a Jewish dating app called JDate. Wendy had once said that she was looking for a man of the world, someone who achieved something and saw a thing or two. Dan met this dream of hers, and she was an ambitious, promising young woman. They got married in February 2006. Together, they made a smart and attractive couple, 
and they were doing good work no matter their personal issues. But cracks showed in their marriage from the very beginning. Dan and Wendy's parents had agreed to split the costs of the wedding. The Adelsons wound up organizing the catering. Dan wanted a kosher caterer and felt sure that Wendy's parents would honor this request, being Jewish themselves. On the day of the wedding, however, it turned out that the caterer was not kosher. One of Dan's friends described this insult as an omen of bad things to come. In fact, played a part in that divide between the in-laws and Daniel Markell. Dan was given tenure in 2010, and Wendy became a law professor too. However, by this point, their marriage was crumbling. In 2012, Dan went away on a business trip. When he returned, Wendy and the kids were gone. Their family home had been devastated. She had helped herself to any furniture and belongings she wanted, including Dan's tennis racket and family jewelry. Not even their elder son's bed had remained. The only evidence his children had ever been there was an old crib mattress left on the floor. Divorce paperwork was in an envelope on what had been the couple's bed. Wendy wouldn't tell Dan where she had taken his children. She gave him no correct information according to divorce statements, implying she'd lied. She had actually taken them to her parents' house in Coral Springs. Wendy's parents were Donna and Harvey Adelson. Harvey was a dentist. Donna was a former teacher who worked to support her husband's dentistry practice, a family-focused woman who'd once appeared on Wheel of Fortune. I'm responsible for the activities, classes, and lessons of my son, Robert, who was 16, Charlie, who was 12, Wendy, who was 10, my husband, Harvey, who's in the audience. They were a successful family, and Donna was protective over their well-to-do image. According to Robert, the oldest son, she even signed off on who the kids dated. This had caused conflict for Robert, who had been in love with an Indian-American woman who practiced Hinduism. The Adelsons forced him to break it off, adamant that he should marry within his faith. Consequently, he married a Jewish woman from Dallas. But this marriage didn't last, and after it broke down, he returned to his ex and married her on a traditional Hindu wedding ceremony. Surprisingly, Donna and Harvey attended the wedding, but a rift caused by Donna's overbearing presence in her son's life remained. It comes as no surprise then that Donna had a role in Wendy and Dan's marriage. Donna helped her daughter pick Dan through a Jewish dating site. She wanted Jewish grandchildren and she got them. But Wendy and Dan's marriage fell apart and the divorce turned nasty, threatening the Adelson family's custody of their children. The final divorce agreement settled at the end of July 2013 less than a year before Dan was killed, included a 50-50 custody arrangement. But this did not end the court battles. Wendy wanted to move herself and her children back to Coral Springs permanently. She'd been offered a job in the area and filed a motion that her extended family, the Adelson clan, lived there and could provide childcare support. Dan challenged the motion. He said that Wendy's affluent parents were bankrolling her litigation, and indeed they were. Emails were revealed in which Donna told Wendy that the Adelson family could offer Dan $1 million to let the children move to Coral Springs. Donna wanted to bribe her daughter's ex-husband for control of the kids. Wendy refused to do this. Donna then suggested that Wendy threatened to convert the children to Catholicism if he didn't back down. But Dan wouldn't back down, and Wendy's motion to relocate was denied. He filed his own motion not to allow Wendy unsupervised visits with their children, claiming she'd been disparaging to them. This motion was still pending on July 18, 2014, when Dan pulled into the driveway of the house he used to share with his family, unaware of what was waiting for him. At 11.02 a.m., police received word of a shooting at Dan's address. A neighbor had called 911. He had heard a gunshot across the street. He had then witnessed a car pulling out of the driveway after the gunshot, a Prius. Unbeknownst to the neighbor, that Prius had been following Dan all that day. 
He went to investigate, but Dan's car was there with the engine running. So he thought there was nothing to worry about. As I got back in, I kind of stood right at this window and why I'm not sure, but uh, I just thought I would stand there for a minute or two and wait for him to go ahead and back out and leave. Uh, And uh, after maybe three or four or five minutes, he hadn't backed out yet. And I said to my wife, I said, something seems wrong to me. I don't know what it is. Uh, Danny hadn't left yet. Uh, I think I'm going to walk back over there and check things out. He went back over to Dan's house. In the garage, he found Dan slumped in the driver's seat of his car with the window broken and covered in blood. His uh, driver's side uh, window is shattered and he's battered and can't answer. He's inside. I don't know if... Somebody tried to shoot him or if he shot himself or what, I don't know. Dan was still alive. He was rushed to hospital while the police began to secure the scene and try to work out what had happened. They found Wendy at a local restaurant and took her in for interview. This was her reaction when they revealed that Dan would not survive. There was a shooting at uh, your home or your your ex-husband's home at 2116 Trescott, okay? Um, Your husband, your ex-husband, excuse me, Daniel, all right, has been taken to the hospital. Um, He's not gonna survive. Oh my God. Okay? (laughs) Would you ever ask someone to do something like this? Not in a million years. Wendy seemed upset at Dan's death, but more telling was her suggestion of why he was dead, that someone might have killed him on her behalf. She went on to talk about her middle brother, Charlie. Charlie was a periodontist in his father's dentistry practice with a history of professional malpractice and risk-taking behavior. My name is Dr. Charlie Adelson, and I am a periodontist, owner, and co-partner with my father, Dr. Harvey Adelson, who's a cosmetic dentist. My brother, um, the one his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to, he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste, and it was a joke he made. He bought the TV for me this morning that got broken, and I was talking to him about whether it made sense to pay to fix it or whether I should get a new one, and it was always his joke that, like, he knew Danny treated me badly, and it was always his joke. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV, so instead I got you this TV. Charlie had joked about hiring somebody to kill Dan, and now Dan was dead. Wendy called her mother to tell her what happened at 7.03 p.m. Hi, Mom. How's it going? Mom, I need you to sit down. I am fine. The boys are fine. Um, Danny has been shot. Um, and I don't think he's going to make it. She asked Donna to tell Charlie, too. Cell records indicate Donna called Charlie at 7.11 p.m., which went to voicemail. Charlie called her two minutes later, and they talked for nearly six minutes. He called her again 15 minutes later. Then, at 7.36 p.m., Charlie called Catherine McBonawa. Catherine McBonawa had been Charlie's girlfriend in 2013. They'd attended a Halloween party together that year, and as they were getting in the car to leave, he asked her, Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. And at the time, what was your relationship with Sigfredo? wasn't the best but he was the father of your children right yes, ma'am. Yeah. so were you dating both men at this time or were you only dating no, Charlie? i was only dating charlie all right did it go any further than that at that time not at that not that night right. I don't did you so. know who he wanted harmed did at that time no ma'am sigfredo garcia was the father of Catherine's two children he was connected to luis rivera the leader of the north miami group of the latin kings gang The police tracked phone records and car rental paperwork to discover that it had been Rivera who had hired the Prius 
that had been seen at the scene of the murder. An ATM security video also showed Rivera and Garcia in the Prius together on July 18, 2014, as they were returning to Miami from Tallahassee, just hours after the attack on Dan Markle. The evidence against these two criminals was mounting. They had followed Dan around all morning. When he pulled into his driveway, Garcia shot him twice in the jaw with the gun Rivera had procured before speeding off in the Prius and leaving him to bleed out behind them. But Rivera and Garcia had no reason to kill Dan Markle. They had no connection to him at all. No connection except through Catherine McBonawa and Charlie Adelson. The police knew this. In 2016, they began a covert operation to uncover just how deep the plot went. They tapped the cell phones of Charlie, Donna, and Catherine and employed undercover officers. With covert tactics, they could draw the Adelsons into making a mistake, and they did. An undercover FBI agent came up to Donna on the street. He posed as a member of Rivera's gang, the Latin Kings. He gave her the press release from Dan's murder and asked for $5,000 to compensate the family of Rivera, who was already in prison. If she paid, she'd be admitting she owed Rivera, who had already been charged with murder. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? Hey, go. Just want to give you this. Um, listen, <laughs> you. <laughs> you're scared. No, don't be scared. Listen, just want to let you know that uh, we know that your family uh, has been taking care of Katie and her friend Luto for quite some time after your problem of North has been solved. And I want to let you know that my brother, he's incarcerated. He helped your family with this problem you guys had up north. And we want to make sure that he's going through some rough times. We want to make sure that you take care of, the, of what he's going through, the way you're taking care of Katie and uh, Tuba. Well, this will explain it. Thank you. But the agent didn't need for her to give him the money. All the FBI needed was for her to call her alleged accomplice, Charlie Adelson, and she did. Donna talked vaguely about some paperwork she'd been handed, wisely not wanting to disclose it over the phone. Charlie tried to guess what she was hinting at. I've got some, I've got some paperwork. Hand delivered. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably both of them. What's that? Probably the two of them. So, probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. On a further phone call, Charlie asked for more details. What is the kind of asking? What do they ask for? Um, you know, I don't know. This TV is probably, TV is probably about five. They asked you for $5,000? Mm hmm. That's fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I mentioned, um, you know, like an ex girlfriend. Their conversation about the TV had eerie similarities to Wendy's conversation with the police right after Dan's murder, when she said that Charlie had joked about the price of a hitman versus the price of a TV. Into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV. And now, Donna and Charlie were talking about the price of the TV like some sort of code in response to the FBI sting operation. This, plus the reference to an ex-girlfriend, surely meaning Catherine McBonawa, implied that both Charlie and Donna had something to do with Dan's death. The next day, Charlie met Catherine at a restaurant. This meeting would be his undoing. The FBI was able to record the conversation, and though he didn't directly admit to the murder, he spent a long time discussing whether the messenger asking for $5,000 was an undercover cop or not. If Charlie wasn't guilty of anything, then he had nothing to fear. But he sounded paranoid. Is it the police? I can't take the money. I can't take the money. They won't even come meet you. It's fucked up. Is it this guy? Maybe in the back of his head, he knows. And 
shoes if you are. If you can't do it, I'll have someone else do it. Charlie was now making threats himself. He knew he could be exposed for what he'd done by this man who claimed to know Rivera and claimed to know how they had plotted to kill Dan together. The audio recording was certainly incriminating. But at the time, in 2016, the audio quality was too bad to make out exactly what he'd said. The police couldn't arrest him yet. They did, however, arrest Catherine McBanoa. She was key in linking the contract killers to the Adelson family. Her bank records showed a suspicious pattern of transactions. Though she had previously been employed at a different dental office in Miami, shortly after Dan's murder, she began receiving handwritten paychecks for over $400 signed by Donna Adelson as part of the Adelson family practice. Occasionally, Catherine received this money in advance of the work listed on the paycheck, like it wasn't for work at all. Right. This is a visual representation of her income for 2014. The red in this case is cash deposits. And 2014 was the year that Dan Markell was murdered. That's your understanding? Yes. She also made an unusual number of cash deposits following the murder. In the year before the murder, she had deposited about $15,000, 10000 of which had been in the four months before the murder. In the year after Dan's murder, however, Catherine deposited over $44,000. This was in excess of her paychecks from the dental office where she didn't actually work. She had also had breast implants. How much did that breast augmentation cost? Cash was paid in the amount of $4,000, then $400, and then $13.50. Where was she getting all this money from? And why was there so much more of it after Dan's death? Catherine, Rivera, and Garcia had all been arrested. In 2016, Rivera pled guilty to second-degree murder. You said you initially thought that this was going to be a robbery. What gave you that idea? Why did you think it was going to be a robbery? I, I was, I'm a jack boy. Okay. I, said, I, rob, I, dro I rob drug dealers. I didn't understand when he was talking to me. First, I thought it was going to be like a robbery. Just a robbery? I thought it was going to be a simple robbery. But then that's I said, we kept going on talking about it. That's when he told me, listen... We're coming out. I got to come up here for a job. I'm finna get hired. We're getting hired, but to kill somebody. In 2019, Garcia was convicted of murder in the first degree. After a hung jury, Catherine McBonawa was found guilty of first degree murder at her retrial in 2022. On count one, which is the count of first degree murder, you have been found guilty uh, by a jury. You will be adjudicated guilty and you will be sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility for probation or parole. On count two, which is the conspiracy to commit murder, you have been found guilty by a jury, you will be adjudicated guilty, and you will be sentenced to a consecutive sentence of 30 years in the Department of Corrections. But these people had facilitated the murder. The people who wanted Dan dead remained at large. Then, in 2022, a new development. A Fort Lauderdale dentist is charged in connection with the 2014 murder of his brother-in-law, who was a professor at Florida State University. 45-year-old Charles Adelson was taken into custody at his home this morning. He's accused of participating in a murder-for-hire plot against his brother-in-law, Dan Markle. The FBI had finally managed to enhance the audio recording of Charlie and Catherine at the restaurant. His guilt had become evident, and they could arrest him at last. But the course of justice would not run smooth. At his trial, Charlie offered a bizarre, convoluted explanation for his involvement in the murder. That he had been extorted into paying Catherine, Garcia, and Rivera for the killing. He claimed that they had learned that the Adelsons had offered Dan $1 million to allow Wendy to leave Tallahassee. Sensing an opportunity for money, Charlie claimed that Garcia and Rivera had made the plan to kill Dan on their own. They had threatened to kill Charlie, too, if he didn't pay them off, or so he claimed. And I was told that if I didn't pay in 48 hours, I would be killed. Charlie had acted with extreme suspicion over the undercover agent's blackmail attempt, even talking about having him killed over only $5,000. Now, 
Charlie was claiming that he'd given up a third of a million dollars without any struggle and without calling the police to help protect him from the murders of his brother-in-law. This was a transparent attempt to save himself from justice. The whole theory of this defense is that this defendant was so fearful of Sigfredo Garcia that he couldn't do the normal thing. He couldn't report this. But he continued to date Catherine Magbanawa, Garcia's baby mama, after all this. After July 1, when they had this incident in the roadway. After the extortion. And even after that, he continues to send love notes to Sigfredo Garcia's woman. Even after the two of them get back together, <coughs> he's still sending those notes. The jury found him guilty of first-degree murder after only three hours of deliberation, and he was taking his mother down with him. Verdict. Count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the indictments, first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. Count two. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two of the indictment, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Count three. Following the verdict, he talked to Donna on the phone from prison. She knew the police were coming for her next, and she discussed her plans to escape the country with her husband, or, failing that, their double suicide. I'm a suicide. I want to go to sleep and not see my son. I do. Perfectly honest, I do. And what we do it together? We'll do it together. Leave a note. They'll know when to come and get us, and we'll do it together. The boy. Look. I'm going to make a decision at some point. So after speaking to Dan this morning and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't. Donna was planning her escape to a non-extradition country, and not only her escape. Her words implicated Harvey Adelson's involvement, too. The plot had entangled almost everyone in the family. On November 7, 2023, the couple booked flights to Vietnam, a country that does not have an extradition treaty with the U.S. They were scheduled to leave on November 13. That very day, the police got an arrest warrant, and they stopped her at the airport. Her escape failed. <laughs> Donna maintains her innocence. She is currently awaiting trial. But what about Wendy Adelson, the center of this whole case? She hasn't been charged with anything. But some speculate that she could be the next Adelson brought down by this extended investigation. How can you say you love those boys if you don't care who killed the father that they loved? Of course I care who killed the father that they loved. That you don't care to find out who it is that killed Professor Markell? This is not that I don't care to find out. My job is to take care of those boys, and that is what I do. I don't see how it helps take care of them to go reading and watching and soaking up all of the horrible information that's out there. You don't realize that you could be helpful in finally untangling this to give this jury the truth about what happened to Professor Markell? I have been nothing but helpful since this started. In Charlie's trial, Wendy's ex-boyfriend Jeffrey Lacasse whom she was seeing at the time of Dan's murder, took the stand. He suggested that the previous summer, a year before the killing, Wendy had known about Charlie's hitman plans. She asked to speak to me confidentially in a very serious tone of voice, told me that Charlie had investigated all possible options to take care of the problem of Danny Markell, including hiring a hitman which would cost about $15,000. 
And I later revised that and thought maybe it was $50,000, but the dollar amount was the only thing in question. She definitely said that Charles Adelson had looked into hiring a hitman to kill Danny Markell. And when did she say Mr. Adelson had looked into hiring a hitman? When the relocation was denied the previous summer. When she said this, what was her demeanor like? She's very serious. All right, so definitely not the to be confused with the TV joke? No, I'd heard that joke repeatedly. I knew that joke. This was something very different. This was chilling, a little scary, made my stomach flip. I found it disturbing. He also said he had thought he was being framed for the killing. The Monday before the murder, July 13th, Jeffrey and Wendy had a difficult conversation. During that conversation, she, she didn't have any interest in spending any time with me for the rest of the week. So it kind of confirmed, like, you know, this is over. Mm -hmm. um, but then when she called me back, she had a series of detailed questions about what I would be doing on Friday. Friday was July 18th, the date of the murder. Jeffrey said he would be driving to Atlanta, and she asked him bizarre questions about what route he would be taking. If I had left on my trip at the scheduled time that she had known about for quite a while, um, I would have driven pretty close to Danny Markell's house about the same time as at the murder um, in a similar looking car to the suspect vehicle. He drove a silver Nissan, easily mistakable for Garcia and Rivera's silver Prius. Luckily, he made a last minute decision to leave for Atlanta on Thursday night, instead the 17th. He did not tell Wendy about the change in plans. Whether or not Wendy was involved in the murder of her ex-husband, the Adelson's good name has forever been tarnished at the center of one of the most notorious contract killings in Florida history. Dan Markle was a problem, and Charlie Adelson conspired to solve that problem in a horrible way. How involved the other family members were in this twisted crime remains to be seen. What are your thoughts on this awful story? Will Donna be found guilty and join her son in prison? Was Wendy involved too? Until next time, stay safe. Keep up with our channel and we will see you again very soon on The Decoder.